Marcus Pontius Pilate was a shining example of a Roman governor, by which to say he was a massive jerk. Historian Philo, writing about Pilate not long after his rule in Jerusalem, describes Pilate as having a vindictiveness and furious temper, being naturally inflexible, a blend of self-will and relentlessness, with a governing style described by his corruption, his acts of insolence, his habit of insulting people, his cruelty, his continual murders of people untried and uncondemned, and his never-ending and gratuitous and most grievous inhumanity. Sounds like a winner, right? But something happened to Pilate about a year before a certain Jewish street preacher found himself being interrogated by Pilate. So if you'll allow me, let me give you a little history lesson. Pilate's patron was a guy named Sejanus. And if if Pilate was a massive jerk, Sejanus was what I would call a majestic jerk waffle. Because, see, Sejanus was a close advisor to Emperor Tiberius, but Sejanus wasn't happy just being an advisor to to the emperor. Oh, no. Sejanus wanted to be emperor. So he seduced Tiberius's daughter-in-law in order to get close to Tiberius's son in order to slowly poison Tiberius's son, leading to the death of the heir of Tiberius. Now, of course, when Tiberius' son died, Tiberius was beside himself and withdrew from public life, essentially hiding himself on an island for a couple years. All the while, Sejanus was essentially the emperor. And with Sejanus in power, it let Pilate do whatever he wanted because his benefactor was the one who was in charge. So when Pilate entered Judea to become the governor, he broke with tradition. You see, when Roman governors were to come into Judea before, they would remove the idols and certain symbols off of their equipment so as not to offend the Jewish people, who had, of course, a commandment, don't make an idol. So they'd remove their idols, and it was, just a, it was a thing to try to keep peace. So, of course, what does Pilate do? but leave all the idols on and march right on into Jerusalem, which caused a massive protest. Now, the Jewish people who were protesting were so upset by Pilate's actions that even when threatened with death by Pilate's soldiers, they didn't relent. And only then, knowing that it's never a good idea to start out your rule as governor of somewhere with a massive slaughter, did Pilate finally relent and remove the images? Then a little bit later, Pilate decided that Jerusalem needed an aqueduct. And so he took money from the temple treasury to build this aqueduct. Understandably, the Jewish people protested again. And this time he sent his soldiers into the crowd disguised and at Pilate's signal, ordered them to kill indiscriminately, whether they were a protester or just someone who was there watching what was going on. That's the kind of person Pilate was. So why in the world, when a nobody Jewish leader named Jesus came before him, did Pilate not just either kill him or ship him on his merry way? Why go through all of the stuff that Pilate did with Jesus? Well, in in and around AD 31, Jesus was probably crucified around AD 33, and in around AD 31, after a five-year absence, Tiberius suddenly came back to Rome. And Sejanus very quickly found himself with his head rolling down some steps. He was arrested for conspiracy and his body 
thrown down these certain stairs in Rome, which was where you threw down people who died so dishonorably that they're no longer considered important people. So with Sejanus gone, Pilate now has lost his patron. Now, Pilate had continued on the way he had been doing things, and he decided that to honor the newly returned emperor Tiberius, he was going to set up in Jerusalem some golden shields to honor Tiberius. But he really did it to tick off the Jews. But, you know, these were, in theory, to honor Tiberius. The Jewish people didn't like it. They protested, but this time... They wrote a letter. They wrote a little letter to Emperor Tiberius himself saying, look how terrible your governor has treated us. And Tiberius actually wrote back with a rather scathing rebuke of Pilate saying, uh, or he wrote according to the historian Philo again, with a host of reproaches and rebukes for his audacious violation of precedent and bade him at once to take down the shields. Now, I mention this because this is probably why Pilate was so quick to acquiesce to the demands of the Jewish leaders, especially after in the next chapter they say, if you do this, you are no friend of Caesar. Because Pilate was rather well known as a friend of the recently executed for treason Sejanus. And he was trying to make himself look good because being well known as a friend of a recently executed person for treason means you really want to make sure you play nice with the new old guy. Because he's not really the new guy. He's... He wanted to make sure he stayed on Emperor Tiberius' good side. And Tiberius had both just yelled at him for being too violent and he was really close friends with a traitor. And so trying to avoid the people rioting, trying to avoid another letter being sent to the emperor, he condemns Jesus and releases instead Barabbas in order to appease a group of people who have already shown themselves willing to appeal to the emperor regarding him. Now, Pilate is a great example of how the kingdom of the world does things. In theory, he's there to govern the people, but he seems to be much more about his own interests, covering his own rear end, so to speak. And Pilate is, in essence, for all his cruelty, a coward so afraid of losing his position that he will condemn what he says to be an innocent man. And when it comes to the kingdom of the world, they always tend to flow the same way towards corruption, selfishness, and jerkishness. Look at King Solomon, a king who was blessed by God with wisdom by the end of his rule. Well... He was a sufficiently large jerk that God took four-fifths of his kingdom away. As the saying goes, after all, power corrupts. And we can see that throughout human history. The kingdoms of this world are selfish, are corrupt, and can sometimes quite often act like jerks. And yet we have here this conversation between a shining example of the world's kingdoms and Jesus, the living example of the kingdom of God. And Pilate can't wrap his head around Jesus. He's trying to figure out, one, why Jesus is here, and two, if, is he a king, and how does this kingdom work? Because Jesus wasn't stirring up a rebellion. 
He wasn't trying to be a ruler. In Pilate's eyes, he didn't do anything illegal. And finally, when Jesus admits to being a king, Pilate still has no idea what to do with it. Because Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Even when claiming to be a king, Jesus didn't do anything treasonous. His kingdom was another place. And it's because Jesus' kingdom is about as different as you can get from the world's kingdoms. The Roman emperor of the t- empire of the time, its borders were as far as the army could conquer. But where are the borders of the kingdom of God? Wherever God's love reaches. When the Roman emperor empire emphasizes authoritarian rule by the emperor, the kingdom of God is one in which the king will kneel down, tie a cloth around himself, and wash his disciples' feet. In an empire where the enemies of the throne are executed, in the kingdom of God, the king is executed so that the enemies of the kingdom can have life. It's these values that confuse Pilate and have confused the world for as long as the kingdom of God has been in the world. When Pilate hears this, he goes, what is the truth? Because the kingdom of God is something that goes against our human nature. The kingdom of God says, find the person who is other and love them. Where the kingdom of the world says, Protect your own. Keep yourself apart. The kingdom of the world says, be nice to people who are nice to you. The kingdom of God says, love your enemies. Do good for them. The best description that we have of how the kingdom of God works is the Sermon on the Mount. And when you read through it, you go, this is... This is what the kingdom of God looks like? If someone steals my jacket, I should give him my shirt? If someone smacks me on the right cheek, I should offer the left? This doesn't make any sense. But Jesus lived out that Sermon on the Mount. Jesus lived out the kingdom of God. And he calls us to do the same. He calls us to not embrace the kingdom of the world, but to embrace his kingdom. To embrace a kingdom based around love. Love for our neighbor. Love shown to the world in the same way that Christ showed love to us. Because in the kingdom of God, we are called to remain in him, to love one another, and to wash one another's feet. That's the kingdom that Jesus is a part of. Not one that rules with cruelty, but one that rules with love. Love shown through us to the world. Because where God's love is, that's where God's kingdom also is.